<laughs> Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Deacon Jonathan Stewart. Uh, this is the web's premier talk show about Gnosticism, Gnosis, the esoteric, mysticism, meditation, and whatever else we feel like talking about today, and whatever else you feel like talking about today, because we are well overdue for another uh, listener. Uh, watcher, viewer, questions from the Gnostic at least. Uh, joining me to answer these awesome questions is, of course, my co-host, Bishop Lady Peterson. Hello, Bishop. Hello, Deacon. How are you today? Oh, I'm pretty good. Yeah, just we're we're at about the the year anniversary of the of the lockdown, and yeah. uh, some things went a lot worse than I thought they would, and some things went a lot better than I thought they would. Um, we're we're not out of the woods yet, obviously, and. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be new and shocking and horrible things happening in the next couple of months and years, maybe not even related to COVID. But that said, feeling optimistic, spring is here. Yes, absolutely. You know, what a long, long, strange trip it has been. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. We talk about movies a lot on this show. And when I remember when, this, when it, the lockdown started to happen, I had already been deployed as part of my emergency response team here in Chicago to... Uh, to staff the Chicago uh, Health Department uh, telephone line uh, to answer questions. And what I remember very distinctly was it was in March and it, we were having the kind of the traditional March weather. So it had this um, like permanent twilight outside, even in the morning and in the afternoon. So it had this very foreboding movie-like quality when you, when you go, when you see everything like in that kind of that permanent that dusk and twilight thing going on, you know, something really bad's going to happen. And, and it was just, you know, I remember that very, very clearly, but now it is absolutely gorgeous. It yes. is sunny. It is beautiful here. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that right now. Precisely. Now we have gotten, uh, less you and I and more uh, Father Tony, we have gotten negative feedback that people don't want to hear us talk about the weather at the top of the show. But if you're not from our hemisphere, you don't understand. This is an important, yeah. this, is, this, is a, this is a Gnostic thing to talk about the weather and the effect that it has on us. Well, I'm only talking about the weather and because of what happened last year exactly. and, that, and that the weather last year, it was very, very foreboding. And uh, this year it is actually far more positive and, and, and friendly and uh, happy. So, <laughs> yeah, talk about that permanent twilight. I remember last year and uh, don't misinterpret me. Obviously, there, there's nothing uh, weird or strange uh, about um, Hasid Jewish people, but I live in a, in a Hasid community and we had that same permanent twilight and it was Passover. So to, to celebrate Passover, obviously that community couldn't gather in the synagogues, couldn't gather together for prayers. So they would all come out on their decks and, and pray together. And it was actually quite moving. But during that permanent yeah. twilight, kind of coming home in that twilight, where there's all these men chanting in a uh, uh, foreign language, uh, mystical language, a strange language, dressed head to toe in black. And, you know, it's not quite light. It's not quite dark. And they're part of the shadows and you're surrounded by chanting. I'm not necessarily saying it was negative or scary, but it's, it's definitely something I'll remember. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was it was at a time when things were, were very turned upside down. I remember seeing a cartoon uh, or comic, I should say, um, in which you had a family gathering for first night of Passover and you hear a child saying, Father, why is this night not like any other night? Yes. And it was, that was from last year, you know, and it was just, it, it was very, very moving. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah, I'm not going to lose it right here, but yeah. No, no exactly. But this is, this is a good time capsule because, of course, you know, these live on forever as videos and uh, podcasts. So people listening in the future, you, you get to know exactly what we've been going through in real time. So, um, okay, we better get into these these great questions from our great uh, uh, fans, whatever you want to call them, our, our fellow Gnostics, uh, uh, I would say viewers and listeners. <laughs> because I forget that we're both a podcast and a YouTube show. The Gnostic Elite is what I'll call mm -hmm. them. So the okay. first question is from Lux01. Uh, Lux always has great questions and is one of the mods uh, at the, the Reddit slash R Gnostic uh, subreddit, uh, which is actually the, a pretty great community. Surprising. I shouldn't say, I, I guess I should say surprisingly because there's lots of negative online communities out there and there's lots of them on Reddit. So they're doing a really great job of having a, a fairly healthy, fairly interesting 
mm -hmm. online uh, uh, message board community for, for Gnosticism. So, so check that out. Uh, so thank you, Lux. And Lux wants to know, what are your thoughts on the intersection of and the interaction between Gnostic studies as an academic subject and Gnosticism as itself a reborn spiritual tradition? Uh, Bishop, do you want to start with that one? Well, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's a really good question. Um, what would I say, the you know, the intersection? Um, I, I guess one of the things that I'm a little more, well, that I'm interested in is how, okay, the the, the rediscovery of Don Kamada and, and the subsequent scholarly study of those texts um, certainly did make Gnosticism uh, more of a mainstream idea. It took a while, but I would like to point out that Elaine Pagel's books, Gnostic Gospels and say Adam, Eve and the Serpent um, were very popular books. They were part of the Book of the Month Club. Yep. Yep. And so, bestsellers. yeah, I mean, you know, the, and you, you know, you could find them, you could find them anywhere. And she, and she became known as a popular, I mean, she was a scholar, but she also wrote a lot of popular books for the mainstream market, the non-scholarly market, I should say. Not that they weren't scholarly, but they were intended for non-scholars to read. So I think that uh, certainly that there, there was that flow of information and the fact that you had somebody like Elaine Pagels who knew how to write and who could write well for lay people certainly I think has had a major impact. Yeah. On, on on that. Um, not to say that there weren't people that weren't interested in Gnosticism before. We know out of the continental esoteric traditions, you know, there were the, the various revitalized Gnostic lines, but they were also not necessarily making use of Nakamata. They couldn't because they hadn't been discovered yet. Um, so I think that Elaine Pagel's work and, and Karen King's work um, and, and that information that, you know, got started getting disseminated and then we started seeing um, obviously the pop culture references. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it, that it had a huge impact because, and, and I guess, again, in Elaine Pagel's case, you had a, a legit scholar who could also write for mass market. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting question. And uh, I know I say this a lot when we do these shows, one deserving of a whole show, because yeah. I, I think modern Gnosticism, revived Gnosticism, Gnosticism as a spiritual practice and religion has a very unique relationship to academia that other faith traditions don't necessarily have. Uh, maybe some of the exceptions, I guess, maybe some of the, the pagan revival religions, wherein if, if you're a Buddhist, you don't, you don't need scholars. Right, I'm sure it's great to have if you're a very dedicated Buddhist. But for for the re, for revival Gnostics who are very interested in uh, ancient Gnostic texts and knowing what the ancient Gnostics did to reflect upon their practice in the present day, right? We need scholars uh, because it's it's not an unbroken tradition and. I think also uniquely as well, the discoveries and thoughts of secular scholars uh, who are, at least are working in a secular way, they, they may have their own private religious beliefs, can uh, import, impart information that is um, interesting and uh, can make powerful connections and breakthroughs for for practicing Gnostics, right? I think of April DeConnick and her book, The Gnostic New Age, where, you know, she's not writing it as a Gnostic practitioner, obviously. She's not a Gnostic practitioner. She's a scholar. But there's a lot in that book that uh, sort of helped me think of uh, some some things in a different way. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that's very unique. I, I don't think a lot of other religions uh, religions have that. Uh, the, the other thing as well, um, just for first thoughts on it, you know, we talked to a lot of really amazing uh, top tier uh, leaders and their class scholars on this show. Right. Yeah. Uh, most most of whom are, again are are his are, are basically historians of religion or sociologists of religion. Right. If you know how religious studies works, religious studies scholars. Where you know if we had a Christian or Buddhist podcast, obviously we'd probably have the the occasional scholar on. But if we were a, a faith based podcast, we wouldn't be talking so much to that angle of religious studies, right? We'd probably right. be talking to more theologians and practitioners. Um, and it's really great talking to these these scholars who, whose work we really admire. And, and, you know, when I approach them and interact with them, it's it, it can depend on the scholar, but it's 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 a mix of, of 
of people who um, seem really interested that someone is really interested in their work, which in other two others could be really obscure, right? But to, but to us can be foundational. Uh, and I think about some of these scholars who perhaps uh, may think of themselves as obscure, but in my mind, these are superstars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and I think too, uh, some of them are also a little bit wary. Like if I was a scholar of ancient Greek religion, I guess if like someone who worshiped Poseidon called me up on the phone, I, I, I might be like, uh, <laughs> what do you want from me, weirdo? Wait, why so, are you reviving a dead religion? Yes, yeah. Uh, good point. Um, yeah. But um, the... And why uh, do you want me to help you do it? <laughs> yes, precisely, precisely, exactly. So, so I don't, I, I'm definitely, I, I can put myself in their shoes or in a similar situation and uh, see exactly why, why they could be a bit confused or a bit wary or be like, who, who, are, who are these wackos? And obviously I'm not talking about any particular scholars. This is a broad, broad, broad general, you know, reflections. Um, yeah. uh, lastly, I'll say there are a handful and literally only a handful, uh, kind of a mixed blessing. Sometimes I wish there was more, sometimes I wish there was less than all three of them. Scholars who, who have studied modern Gnosticism, uh, who study our communities, uh, study people like us, and, and I am overall glad that they're out there doing the work, and uh, and I hope that does catch on more. Now, I, I will say that uh, I have found some very insightful things in, in their work um, uh, that, again, have uh, really um, made me realize, made some connections, and uh, made me realize some, some things about the way I do things and the way modern Gnosticism is. I've also seen a, a few what I consider major mistakes, doing my best not to be partisan, you know, mm -hmm. doing my best which we to be impartial, which of course is very hard, but I at least have a religious studies background. I want to, you know, someday I hopefully want to do uh, 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 some more degrees uh, and actual masters in the field. Uh, I know Bishop Laney, you have a number of masters. So yeah. so I'd like to think I, I can take the collar off and- One life, you know, many masters. No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, take off the collar and, you know, look at it from a religious studies perspective, right? So, um, so in their work, you know, the kind of a mix of, of some really great stuff and, and some stuff that I, that I could be a little bit more critical of. So those, those are my, my thoughts of the intersection between Gnostic studies as an academic subject and Gnosticism. Uh, and there's, there's a lot to go in there. Um, okay, let's go into the next question, which is from Kashiri. Uh, they say, hi. As a Manichaean, I would like to know how the prophet Manny influenced the emerging Gnostic groups coming out of the Near East, and how influential is he, and more importantly, his teachings today amongst contemporary and restorationist movements. Um, I'll jump in, and I'll start with this one. Uh, cool that there's Manichaeans out there. So, uh, Kashira, you'll have to get in touch and, and tell us more about your, your understanding of Manichaeanism and your daily practices and your faith and, and what have you. I, I know that there, there are individuals calling themselves Manichaeans who have no connections to wider communities. I know that there are restorationist Manichaean groups, and there are actually Buddhist Sanghas in China that have lineages that go back to Manichaean Buddhism, that are living traditions that are on broken lineages, very, very small groups, and a lot of their teachings. Uh, as, as I understand it, um, are, are more Buddhist and Manichaean. Uh, I will link up our show about Manichaeanism, so I don't have to explain it, but it's a Gnostic-influenced religion that was uh, one of the largest religions in the world and basically the first uh, uh, international religion that was on multiple continents, uh, starting in the Mediterranean and spreading to the East. When it got to the East, it took on uh, more Buddhist characteristics. Um, so... Uh, the emerging Gnostic groups coming out of the Near East. Uh, I can't really speak to that, although I wouldn't be surprised if some of the Buddhist Manichaean groups do look at some of the scholarship and look at some of the Manichaean texts that have been coming out over the last hundred years. There are We have a lot of Manichaean texts, not a lot have been translated actually. We have a lot more than say we would have, uh, than what we think of Cephian or Valentinian texts. So it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these these more Buddhist groups kind of looked back into their heritage and sort of re-embraced it, and if Manichaeanism might be more of an influence on how they're presenting themselves. Uh, how influential is he, importantly, his teachings today among contemporary and restorationist movements? Uh, I know that uh, Bishop Heller uh, with the um, Ecclesia Gnostica uh, has written uh, about uh, Mani, Mani, and uh, looks to him as, as a Gnostic prophet. Uh, and I know that it, with the AJC uh, litur liturgical calendar, there, which uh, predates the 
which is a combination of pre-existing Gnostic liturgical calendars and uh, our, our own input. Uh, so part of what we have inherited has a lot of quotes from Manny in in our liturgical services uh, throughout the liturgical year on Sundays. Uh, kind of a shocking amount uh, because, you know, the next part of my answer is, in my experience, you know, the AJC is, is very open, uh, but for figures that we look back to, figures that we read, figures that we talk about at Conclave, uh, uh, figures who are big inspirations on our personal practices, there's not a lot of Manny. Uh, perhaps that could change, uh, and there might be individuals within the church or clergy within the church that uh, that may want to focus more on Manny. But in my experience and within our seminary, uh, except for all these many, 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 many Manny quotes, uh, we don't have uh, <laughs> that that much of a connection to him. Uh, him and his community were beautiful writers. I, you know, I would like to see perhaps some more of his texts used, or at least used in a, in a personal way, right? For for your own personal reflection. Uh, a lot of Gnostics that are looking at ancient Gnostic texts. And of course, both Bishop Laney and I have talked about you don't always have to go ancient, folks. We got got lots of great stuff going on in the last couple hundred years. But right. if you're going to look at ancient uh, Gnostic texts, it's often stuff from the from the Nag Hammadi. Um, and how many got onto our liturgical calendar so much? I, I'm assuming that that it is that we we actually did have a lot more of his writing uh, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, than we than we had of some 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 of what we think of as the classical Gnostics, right? Because Nag Hammadi is only discovered in the 1940s, and that actually took a long time to get translated to get translated well and to circulate. So uh, to make a long story short, it, in my in my experience, not a lot of impact uh, on the modern Gnostic movements. But uh, a cool guy, and people should at least be be reading reading more of him. I don't always agree with 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 the Manichaean uh, theology, which I ironically find too dualist. Um, in in Manichaeanism, uh, uh, good and evil are are equal and preexistent, which we think of uh, the ancient Gnostics as being the preeminent dualist. But in, in the beginning, for for the most uh, dualistic of Cephians is is the monad uh, is the one is the unknown father is a divine unity you know day one there's a divine unity and the dualism comes later and at the end of all of this we go back to uh, divine unity and you can make the argument uh, that perhaps we are always within divine unity uh, because it stands outside of time so uh, th th those are all uh, all things uh, about the classical Gnostics, who we think of as dualists, where the Manichaeans, much more dualist, where good and evil, you know, pre-existence before the universe was created, were there and uh, were equal. Uh, so that's my long rant. Uh, uh, Bishop Laney, uh, for you and your communities and your experience, <laughs> anything to do with Manny and Manichaeanism? No. No. No, <laughs> I think you said it. You said it all. I mean, it's, it's just not something that I'm familiar with. I mean, I obviously I've heard of the prophet Mani. I'm, I I know I've heard of Manichaeism and the dualism, but um, it's not something that I have any interaction with. So I, yeah. I can't really comment. No, exactly. And uh, uh, basically, I'm the same, but I'll also have a long comment, apparently. Uh, even though, I, like, obviously, there's a lot of things in his theology that I do like, uh, and within the Manichaean theology that, that I that I do like. And, you know, it is, you know, some people consider it a Gnostic religion, some people don't, uh, for some tactical reasons, and uh, see it heavily, and it's, of course, heavily influenced by Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, if it's not within the family, it's at least a first cousin. Uh, but the, a lot of the the, the writing is quite moving, so I do recommend checking that out. Uh, you can read it, read some for free at gnosis.org, and there's some beautiful translations in uh, Willis and Barnstone's, uh, Willis and Mayer's um, uh, Gnostic Bible. So even if I don't 100% line up uh, behind it, uh, some, some very powerful, some very moving writing. And as I said, it's kind of neat because you, they're very Jesus-centered in, in the original form in the West, and then they, they go to the East, and it's just the flexibility of Gnosticism. You know, Gnosticism needs a delivery system. The, the, gnosis, the gnosis needs that. The gnosis is the letter and the religion around it is the envelope. So it, when it goes to the East, it, it's the same religion, the same concepts, but suddenly it becomes very Buddhist. They stop talking about uh, uh, Jesus as much and talk about the Buddha. They stop talking about uh, the uh, heaven and start talking about nirvana. Uh, they stop talking about fate and start talking about karma. And it, and it still works quite well. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see how the gnosis can be translated uh, into uh, these different religions into these different terms, and it still works, and it's authentic, and it's historical, and it, and it was a very big movement in the East, uh, where actually it, it, it died down due to persecution. So, 
Okay, that's enough on Monty. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. we, we've sort of talked about this before, but there are some, probably a few times before Bishop, but there's we got three or four questions all here together, and I think there's some aspects that we haven't addressed. Always a good topic to talk about because it is a question we get a lot. So let's do it one more time. So this comes from Ritterix, and it's, are our Archons active hostile obstacles like quote-unquote demons, and are they actually conspiring against us? Are they passive forces that just hold us back, akin to just forces of nature? There, are they labels, but not actual active entities? Does knowing them matter in the sense of progr progressing a gnosis, or are they the enemy and a distraction from what we're seeking? So, uh, Bishop, do you want to you tackle that one That's first? That's a good question. Um, yes. my, my sense of the, you know, the Archons, the, the rulers, um, is that they're like a lot of rulers and that they're not terribly eminent. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a ruler, um, there, I mean, there are some cases in which you might have a ruler. I mean, I'm thinking about more like an empire where yeah. you have a ruler that could be thousands, you know, miles away from the, the peoples that he or she is ruling. Um, that have no connection, do not speak the same language, and are not even all that terribly, uh, you know, don't necessarily feel one way or another about what's there. I mean, the, the, the ruler is the law, is the power, but it do, is not necessarily working at or on individuals or even smaller groups of people like cities. I mean, they, they, you know, they, they're going to have governors and various, you know, soldiers and that sort of thing doing that work. So I, I don't tend to think of them, the archons, as being terribly eminent. I don't think of them as a, like St. Paul would talk about having he had a thorn in his side, a demon set to befet him, you know. Um, I don't think of that at all. I tend to think of them as, you know, they, they were an imitation of, or, you know, a, a, a duplicate or a, a faulty duplicate of the Aeon. Um, and I don't, I don't see them as conspiring. I don't necessarily see any particular reason. I mean, when you say getting to know them or having a relationship, I don't know that that's even possible. If you're trying to get an understanding of how this, um, Archon may operate, uh, that, that could, you know, in some cases be interesting as long as it doesn't distract you from the knowledge of, of, the yeah you know, uh, the god above the god above god, um, the, but I, I I don't think of them as being as acting necessarily so much as that they are, and there are laws I guess you could say the you know the, the universe in which we currently operate is operating according to their rulership, but I don't think of them as being necessarily thinking about it, um, and I don't think that they themselves set this up to be this way. So I don't necessarily see them as being evil or having any intentions whatsoever. They, they are, and as a result, the conditions into which we are born, which we live, are. And that is, you know, those conditions and those rulerships are what we are struggling against and which, of course, also shape us as we seek to develop our own souls. Um, but that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I'm quite similar, and I, that's just it. Viewing them through a moral lens, I mean, ultimately, I guess it is good to view them through a moral lens, because I, I think they do cut us off from divinity, but mm -hmm. th they're, I, I think that's just it. Thinking them as, as as little demons, a little demon on your shoulder that's, you know, constantly going around the cosmos, you know, defying God's plan, the personally screwing up your life, personally making you do bad things. The devil made me do it, right? That's not a very sophisticated theology. Um, not, not that I'm saying that the Gnostics are always sophisticated. Sometimes they're very unsophisticated. You don't have, you don't have to be sophisticated for it to be a good idea. But uh, that said, I, I'm basically just agreeing with you. Thinking them as, as impersonal, uh, thinking them as impersonal, perfect. Thinking of them as, uh, I think, a very good modern uh, 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 metaphor uh, did, that we got thanks to the Matrix is artificial intelligence, right? Or as an mm -hmm. algorithm. Uh, and, and actually a great way to think about it is you, the, the creators of, of of social media, of say Twitter and Facebook, didn't originally set out to make a misery engine. But the algorithm naturally lifted up negativity 
because negativity uh, caused uh, more engagement. So for instance, arguments uh, get more uh, engagement on, on Twitter or Facebook, right? Uh, mm -hmm. People are, are writing more. Uh, the, the people are coming back to that thread. People are doing more uh, uh, reactions and emojis. So the algorithm is pre-programmed to lift up engagement. The, it sees the negativity, that's engagement. It lifts it up. That causes more negativity. It becomes a feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's how I think of the archons. They're very much like this social media algorithm. They are they they're built into reality, and uh, because they are not built well, they they cause all sorts of problems. Now it does become moral uh, when, when we get to the human aspects because I think it does have it's it's one of the reasons why there's immorality in the world, right? This mm -hmm. this 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 bad rulership, this horrible rulership, um, and. Uh, also, yes, uh, when we talk about the being Im imminent, I can't even say the word imminent. Uh, I concur that that they're not that they're not quite personalized. Although I think they're imminent in the way that you, you, the arcan the as above, so below, the arconic dim uh, dimensions of this dimension are reflected within the individual. Um, and for getting to know them, you know, the ancient Gnostics, you know, they were very precise. Uh, a lot of them have very precise systems of archons, of what they rule and their names and such. And, and I think they generally wanted people to know them with the idea that if you know your enemy, you can easily overcome it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, it... If, if, if that's part of your spirituality, I think you could probably bang that into a workable system. Uh, but if it's if you don't want to get that specific, identifying archonic forces within you and and the ones that are ruling your life, I think are probably good for your spirituality. Um, and and just becoming more aware of you know what is it that's outside of me that is perhaps influencing me to do this, uh, be it even uh, uh, a bad habit, um, a bad relationship, what have you. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I think about the archons. All right. Then. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think they care what we think of them, by the way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, that's the, the, we're in strong <laughs> agreement there. Yeah. They. they I really, think we they think really... a lot more about them than they do about us. Yep. I, I I completely I completely agree. I completely agree. And and are they literal? I don't know. Uh, they're. I've said this on the show before. I'll continue to say it. Uh, they may not be real, but they act like they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, moving on. Is the figure of Jesus analogous to Neo in the Matrix? That's a Mako 343. I'll uh, jump in there with a yes. Yeah. 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 So, yes, he is. He, he actually sacrifices uh, himself uh, twice in the Matrix trilogy. There's a resurrection. Uh, Neo's an anagram for the one. He, uh, there's all sorts of other things, too. His last name is Anthropos. Uh, no, wait. Uh, what's his last name? His last name is not Anthropos. Um, anyways, his last name means son of man. Uh, the, the, Neo is very deliberately set up as, as a Christ figure in the uh, uh, Matrix uh, trilogy. Not It's not an accidental or subconscious uh, uh, um, similarity. So the the writers uh, definitely 100% meant it. It's sometimes because the Jesus story is just so important uh, in the West, even if you don't want it to be important, even if you don't like it, it, it gets into our unconscious. So you can find works of art that sometimes have uh, uh, biblical or, or Jesus-like reflections in them that, you know, may have come in through the unconscious. But uh, in this case, uh, very, very, very deliberate. Although I, I do wish that there was more in the Bible or the Gnostic scriptures of, of Jesus knowing Kung Fu. Um, and any anything more on that one, Bishop? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think it's an excellent question. I think you're right about yep. that. I also say that, you know, Neo incarnated. Yes. Yep. You know, he actually incarnated into the real world. He, he, he unplugged and as a result, he incarnated. Yep. And uh, that, you know, that's about as clear as can be. And the interesting thing, I think, when you think about it is um, he incarnated and ate pablum, yes. just like you, just like a baby does. Yep. Um, and that was what they could feed these babies who, you know, and some of them weren't, had, had always been in their bodies. They, you know, um, but others, you know, had, had incarnated. And, and I think that, you know, but yes, there, there was this passage of, of incarnation, which um, my, you know, we don't see a lot of this written about, you see it more in the Gnostic, so-called Gnostic scriptures than you do in the canonical scriptures, but that adapting to incarnation and the impact that it must have had on Jesus's psyche. I mean, again, Neo had his 
He had to take his time learning yep. how to be an incarnate being. being. Yep, exactly. Yeah, no, the, uh, the the series, you know, there's uh, there's problems with the second and third one, although I think those could have been fi fixed through editing them into one movie. Uh, but but uh, they were actually shot as one movie and then divided up into two, and it's just it's just too long, and there's mm -hmm. um, uh, there's too much in there. But all all three of them are uh, incredibly clever and incredibly deep, and uh, it, I, I've been meaning to revisit them. We rewatched the first one over uh, over lockdown, and it's 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 much more clever, much more deep than than I think it's even given um, uh, credence to by by its fans. So there, it's 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 definitely a great a great Gnostic text. Yeah. Um, okay. Next one: the counterfeit spirit, the demiurge, fake heavens, etc. Gnosticism talks a lot about spiritual deception. How do you know you're not being deceived in your path, in your experiences, and in your practices? That's from tag.along. Uh, Bishop, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, discernment is one of the, I think it, it's, it's a pretty advanced gift yeah. that a person can have along the path because I think many of us who have been doing this for a while will tell you that, you know, what we thought, Okay, we got it, and then we've been deceived over and over and over again. Um, recognizing, you know, it, it, recognizing, looking back, hindsight, um, that you no, know, you know, that was our ego talking. And I would say that this is absolutely an area where you have to be on a daily basis. You know, there's a re daily renewal of that um, of your practice and your discernment because it we were, we, again we, we've incarnated we're, we're living in a world around us that has these rulers the rulers are in many ways far more powerful than we are and so it's yeah it's it's incredibly easy to fall into deception um you know i would say that discernment um you know what's that going to look like well it may look like genuine transformation in, in you and in the way that you live um it may result in changes in your relationships, hopefully positive changes. Um, but it, it, it's it's not it's not that easy to discern. Okay, am I still on the right path or not? Because I think it's a daily it's a daily shift and a daily change, and it can take a while um, to get anywhere. And then you can just fall back. I mean, I've seen interviews with. Um, Eastern Orthodox hermits and practitioners who will talk about this. They will talk about how they, you know, achieved a certain a, a spiritual um, place in their lives, and, they, and then they and they slid back. And yeah. it, you know that that this is not a one and done once and done thing. And it, this is not easy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I you know I'll, for this one all, all I can do is is just nod along and, and agree with with everything that you said, Bishop, and uh, just add that uh, not to be a downer, but in my opinion, our our capacity for self deception is en is is endless and bottomless, <laughs> um, and, and that's that's just the way it is. Uh, I think that having you know not not. Uh, I'm, I'm wary of gurus, but I think having spiritual friends and teachers and a community that that can help you, right? With uh, uh, with self deception around uh, 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 spiritual insights and spirituality and mm -hmm. uh, spiritual progress, um, and you, some things. You, you know are, are hard to explain unless you've actually experienced them, but. You, there is a reason why all the great religions constantly call for one to be humble and, and why yeah. that is a constant reminder. Yeah. And, and we do talk, uh, you know, we talk a lot of, in some circles, I should say, you know, there's a lot of talk of ego and getting rid of ego. Um, but, but to be honest, most spiritual practices have you reflecting upon yourself and, yeah going deep within yourself and i and i would say that this is this is not necessarily a bad thing but there's a lot of uh, actually it's a good thing but a, and a lot of spiritual practice particularly in western esotericism um but in um say tibetan buddhism is is about power right uh, taking back power empowerments um uh, empowering yourself to live in the world empowering yourself to be above the archons and that that's very explicit 
So I, I think again, one has to be careful, right? Again, that so that that call to be humble is is is. It seems sort of cliche or a very basic teaching, uh, but there is a reason why why it's there, and and I think there is a danger of doing this this internal work and being so self centered. Um, the you know staring at one's belly button actually, if you know that saying, comes from people being critical of the Eastern monks, right, who would sit all day staring mm -hmm. at their belly buttons in meditation. So uh, yeah, I, 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 that's which I think is great, which is what people should be doing, and you know, and that. We should be doing internal spiritual work, uh, but because it is so self-centered, th there is there is a danger there of of ego inflation. Uh, so th this call to be to be humble, to to not get get lost in yourself, uh, mm -hmm. uh, is is very important. Um, yeah, I would also say this is that you pointed out our capacity for self-deception is pretty much limitless. I think we should strive for equal portions of grace toward ourselves and others. Yes, yeah. Um, the, knowing this, knowing that that capacity for self-deception is the willingness to show grace. It doesn't mean being a doormat. And no. it doesn't mean being slack on yourself or letting yourself uh, go, you know, you know or, um, or not, or, or not, you know, correcting your own behavior. But it is also the sense of if we're all, if we are all in the same boat, if we are all in the same situation, that this is the human condition, um, we can refrain from condemning or positing ourselves or other people as being bad people um, necessarily. Yeah. So there, I mean, there are bad people out there, but we, we, we can avoid that. And we can, we, and we can also avoid thinking that we're supposed to be better than others or wanting other people to be better than they really can be. And I think yeah. that, that there is that essence of grace, is, is that recognition that this is the human condition. And if we can have that in abundance, uh, we just might be getting somewhere with the discernment. Yeah, yeah, 100% agree. And, and another uh, traditional uh, Christian concept that's not always talked to, that, that I think a lot of converts, if you have a Christian background to Gnosticism, uh, particularly if you do have a Protestant background, you don't want to talk about grace, right? So, <laughs> but I think leaving leaving the door open, leaving room open for for uh, grace in, in uh, one's uh, philosophy and spiritual practice is, is also quite important. Uh, it also helps you with that, with that self-deception. Um, and yeah, I I mean, you know, just just riffing uh, from what you were saying, I, I find like there are bad, evil people out there. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, you know, a, a truly evil person, when we look at the overall billions of people on Earth, are are in the vast minority. Yeah. And we we really do live, and I, I think this is ironic with the the stereotype of Gnosticism being overly dualistic, which which again uh, I, I don't necessarily think is true. Uh, that we live in very dualistic times, where where we have a lot of people who think that they're they're very very good, and everybody who thinks differently from them is very very evil. And mm -hmm. uh, this is not a political statement because I think this is 100% across the political uh, spectrum. So I am, I am definitely not uh, not pointing the fingers at anybody. This is this is not be dancing around an issue or trying to uh, talk about a particular group or a particular type of person. I, I think it is uh, something that is uh, the true pandemic of our time. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, and yeah, and uh, I, I think uh, so. I'm just agreeing with you with with that being such so prevalent. You know, uh, mm -hmm. having having that sense of of constant grace and forgiveness to everybody around us <laughs> is even more important uh, because of the 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 water that all all of us fish are swimming in at the moment culturally. Yeah. Um, oh man, this is, we'll tackle this one. This is another one that needs to be another show, uh, which I will do. I'm going to start making a list <laughs> so that I'm not constantly saying this. <laughs> Bishop, what is a major misconception about Gnosticism that you would like to clear up? That's from Dose Gem. I would like to clear up that I don't think it was all that distinct from what people consider to be so-called small O Orthodox Christianity. I think that you know there was an awful lot of stuff going on at the, at the beginning of Christianity. There were a lot of different traditions, and uh, there were a lot of different thoughts. And, and uh, many people believe, for example, that the Apostle Paul 
uh, himself had some decidedly Gnostic leadings. Um, and so, or what we call Gnostic. So I would say is, you know, if, if we can go with small o orthodox, and we look at small g Gnosticism, and we can see how that there might have been uh, intersections go, you know, at various times. And there were, there were not this, just a whole bunch of rigidly competing groups, uh, but there may have been some, some, you know, some ebbs and flows between communities and between uh, spiritual currents um, on a different plane there as well. That, that would be one thing that I would probably say. Yeah. And I would like to point out as well, the reason the Orthodox won, uh, because, you know, they were already pretty popular by the time Constantine came along, because that was the sect that he went along with, right? Yeah. The, the reason that the Orthodox won, like, the persecution of other kinds of Christians didn't come until the late 4th century, like the 5th century, you know, pre pretty late, right? So right. one of the reasons the Orthodox won is is we often think of them, um, I think a lot of modern Gnostics or or, or of Christians of, of perhaps alternative stripes, you think of them as, as being very uh, rigid and very not open to other views. But one of the reasons they won is that they were always, they were bringing in, I mean, Catholic, the universal church, the Catholic church, Catholic is means universal uh they want they want to unite everybody into into one church and then would often pick and go with views that were sort of in between what the other sects believed right so you might have a sect that uh believed that that jesus was was not divine right but was mm -hmm. uh was a kind of a prophet and then you might have a, a sect um you know a ascetic sect and some of the early gnostics that said jesus was completely divine not human at all what's the orthodox perspective jesus is both human and divine so one of the reasons that the orthodox are able to overcome the gnostics is they actually brought gnostic ideas into the fold now not everybody embraces the scholarly theory i do but i i do believe the original text of the gospel of john uh was gnostic or proto-gnostic let's go proto-gnostic okay to make some scholars happy so one reason one way to bring the joanite faction into the orthodox church is to bring that scripture into the bible right and then mm -hmm. you also do a rewrite of it john went through you know probably three redactions three major redactions and then we also have the joanine letters uh which seem to uh tamper down some of the the gnostic interpretations of john okay so uh, I guess uh, I guess I'm clearing up more of a this question is supposed to be about clearing up misconceptions about the the, the Gnostics, but the, here I am helping I I think to clear up misconceptions about the Orthodox, right? Of, of them bringing stuff into the fold. No, I guess if I was going to uh, bring up misconceptions about the Gnostics, uh, you know, here we are defending the main line in Orthodox churches. Um, which is which can be good because they do lots of good work, but they do have a Gnostic and mystical heritage, right? Which you can still find, I think, you know, in 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 mainline churches. Just you, you know, with uh, with the weird uh, smaller Gnostic churches, it's the main focus instead of uh, a, a more of a minor focus. Um, gee whiz, I just said there's enough show for this, but what's what's a major conception about Gnosticism that I would like to clear up uh, instead of ranting about uh, proto orthodoxy? Uh, I mean, I've already mentioned it on this show, but uh, it's in, in the course of your interpretation is different. You know, holler at me. But I, I really do see uh, early Nazism as as being monistic, right? Um, and ultimately, being monistic uh, of of having some form of the idea uh, of everything uh, partaking of, of the nature of the divine, uh, of of divinity. You know laying the divine realm the divine re reality laying behind uh, all other realities uh, uh instead of being strictly dualistic like i said with the manichaeans so that's one i one i i come back to uh quite a bit um and and i think that that that's also an interesting one to sort of have um for your approach to to practice and your approach to to the world and and the approach to perhaps how you may meditate or do do other spiritual work um Bishop, oh, here's uh, here's something uh, that we have talked about before, but I think it's um, uh, a cool question. Perhaps it was inspired by one of those previous shows. I suspect it was, which is, what Gnostic religious texts that are more recent, at least the last couple of hundred years, do you advise that people read? And that's from Bunta Twelve. Uh, Bishop, do you have any recs? Well, I mean, my my personal favorite, of course, is Philip K. Dick's uh, Valis trilogy. Yeah. You know that 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 to me. Um, 
pretty, I, you know, and I understand that it's primarily from a Bay Area, um, you know, to a certain perspective, which is, well, I don't know exactly how how U.S. that is, but I mean, I think that he he had his experience. I think it was a legit one, and I think he tried to distill it into something that modern day people um, could understand. And yeah. Um, I, yeah, that 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 is what happened there. And I and I I do recommend um, checking you know checking those texts out. Uh, that was going to be my answer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, read Valis, everybody. It's it's really funny because it's it is in some ways can feel very dated because it's very situated in the 1970s. Although he's yeah. quite open about that. Yeah. Um, that that uh, he's very looking at uh, some very 1970s ideas. In other ways, it's timeless because you know it is it, it is the story of of a spiritual experience and what it can do to your life, and it is the Gnostic mythos, and that makes it timeless. And and another good reason to read it is that it was prescient for today. I actually wonder about younger people reading Philip K. Dick if it has the yeah. same impact it would have on us, Bishop, because it's just a world that we live in now. Yeah, it's <laughs> sci-fi. It's just it's just our yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, um, it, oh, yeah. go ahead. I can also recommend Dune, um, and I know I don't know that Frank Herbert necessarily saw it as a Gnostic text, but I think it's the idea of empire. Yep. And the empire behind the empire, you have, you know, you have commerce, you have the empire, and then you've got the commerce behind that empire. And then you have uh, various organizations that, um, that wield power in political or sociopolitical uh, religious ways. And, 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 and I, I think that if you want to look at what, how empire operates, um, Dune is really good at that. I mean, I think that some of the later books we got more into Herbert's predilections, which <laughs> I really didn't need to know about. Um, but I do think that you have that sense of empire and that kind of this enmeshment between religion and power and society and fate. Yeah. And I think that, that uh, the, the, the books give, that, give a really good sense of that. Um, that it's, they, I wouldn't say they're necessarily Gnostic, Gnostic texts, but they do describe, I think, a lot of what Gnostics see as being this this enmeshment between um, that which may very well be divine and that which is most assuredly not. Yeah, again, I completely agree, and and I'm not sure that they are Gnostic and say, say the same way Philip K. Dick or, or the Matrix is, where you know you're actually sitting yeah. down with the Gnostic scriptures and going to be like, I'm going to make sci-fi based on Gnosticism. Yeah. So not Gnostic in that way, but uh, either consciously or unconsciously. And you know, Herbert, I'm sure was very well read, and you know, obviously is reading a lot about Islam and mystical Islam for those books. So very well could have been reading the Gnostics because I do agree with you that that it is it is a Gnostic text, and uh, in the later books, um, which uh, I haven't read all of them because the quality does start to quite radically decline. And as you said, there's definitely some some peccadillos in there. <laughs> uh, but there's you know the the without getting any spoilers, right? The the the, the the religious aspects become quite demiurgic, uh, so it's it's yes, it's I, I would definitely say that that it is a um, a gnostic text, and and again, you know, the, the, a topic we love coming back to on this show is you know gnosticism and gnostic texts aren't aren't just dusty uh, ancient Coptic scrolls, right? And I would say from day one, uh, uh, the gnostics uh, got gnosis through art. So, yeah. uh, so, so novels, uh, poetry, ballet, opera, movies, all of these can be modern Gnostic texts. Uh, and when we had the Gnostic revival of, of the 1800s, you, you know, the art, artists were, were very, very involved, right? So if you look mm -hmm. at the, the paintings of the symbolists, uh, a lot of Gnostic themes there, and they were, you know, some of them were practicing Gnostics or influenced by, by, uh, other Gnostics, um, I can't think of anybody offhand, but uh, uh, I know that uh, Gurdjieff, you know, was a big influence on on artists and creators of his time. Yeah. Um, and and last episode we talked about the the Theosophists and the big Im impact that they had on uh, art and uh, and literature. But specifically Gnosticism and Gnostics, uh, you know, you can look at at some of these um, 
these, these modern great works of art, I think, be be as as at least almost as inspired and, and insightful into into Gnosticism. That that said, for specifically Gnostic stuff, uh, I think I did reference before uh, Louis Claude de Saint Martin, um, and and actually that you know I, and I don't, I'm not just shilling for my own here uh, because um, uh, I I. I I don't read French, even though I live in a in in a French city, and mm. uh, a lot of the you know when we're talking about the revival Gnostics, the, the uh, most of them uh, in the the first wave uh, are all French, right in the eighteen hundreds, and uh, I was like, what if I read their stuff? Uh, as more is co coming out and then more is translated and I hate it and it's stupid right and mm -hmm. and I'm happy to report that uh that that a lot of it is 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 awesome so there's not a lot of it in English but uh you know uh, looking back and reading some of the the French Gnostics of, of the 1800s uh, I do recommend that you, uh, finding what you can uh, the, of Jules Duanel who I'm like who came across as very eccentric so I'm like what if his reading is awful and it's uh sorry his writing is awful it's actually quite moving and quite powerful and he really did did have insight into Gnosticism, and he really did have insight into the divine feminine. He had a lot of insights into love. So if you can track down Jules, Jules Duanel uh, writings in English, I'll, I'll try to remember to put some some in uh, with the links below. Uh, I do recommend it. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so that's that's it, Bishop. We did it. We we got we to, did it. To the end. We did it. We got to the end of the questions. So uh, I'm just gonna pop in a couple plugs. We don't have a producer for the show. We have weird stuff with scheduling and things for producers for all you people out there. Uh, that said, we still do need money to run the show. So uh, I ask you to I'm gonna be my own producer here to donate at uh, Patreon.com/slash Gnostic. So those at home, hopefully, will be seeing Patreon.com/slash Gnostic appear on the screen. <laughs> For as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can put a cap on that if you're worried about us making a lot of media in that month. You know, you want to control your budget. Uh, if you want to do a one-off instead, you can do paypal.com slash Gnostic. Uh, you can do one-time donations there. And of course, uh, look, I know that these are hard times. I know that they'll probably always be hard times. And uh, I have personal experience with being tight for money and wanting to actually support creators, right? Because, you know, yeah. I do donate on Patreon. I, I do give money to causes that I like. I do give money to creators that I like. But I don't always. And sometimes I have to pause my subscriptions. Um, so there's other ways you can help us. You know, the simplest is just telling someone about the show. You can also share it on your social media you can email your favorite episodes you can like and subscribe on uh youtube you can leave us reviews on the podcatcher of your choice particularly itunes which is a popular one which you know, reviews may really make a difference on itunes and i just checked it out the other day where we don't have very many good reviews and our show rocks so please give a good reviews um okay other plugs which is i do free secular open meditation it's not gnostic meditation it's not religious meditation but if you're uh the, a spiritually curious person or a gnostic or religious or a practitioner meditation is good for you if you're none of those things meditation is good for you uh, so feel free to uh join me 11 a.m sunday mornings uh eastern standard time that's montreal time new york time we've got a great uh crew of people who come out uh we meditate for about an hour it's a mix of silent and guided i give instruction so if you don't have much experience of meditation you will get some guidance and if you have experience of meditation you can ignore that part and you get a, a good hour with uh, a couple minutes talking afterwards. It's always a great time. Uh, the last commercial on my end is holygrail.substack.com. That is uh, my parish in Montreal. We're doing more online activities for at least the next couple of months. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, back in uh, live, uh, back in person soon, or at least gathering outside in parks. But in the meantime, since you're on the internet and I'm on the internet, you know, feel free to check that out. Uh, Bishop, do you have any uh, plugs? Not at this time. Not at okay. this time, I don't. So I'm yeah, glad you right have here. a lot of plugs. Yeah, yeah, I have quite a few there. So I forgot, oh, I forgot uh, to do the... Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I think there are exciting projects coming down the pipe, though, that hopefully we can hype up here. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> we, we can finally sign off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Mrs. Laney. And thanks okay, so much, okay. everybody else. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>